How is everybody today? All right. Well, let's see here. Uh, I got my first slide up there. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank RCAF and Bill for the honor of being able to come up here and speak today and present to you on the topic that was given to me, and that's the Made in America movement and what that means to our company, and I think what that means to our calf and your movement, which is, in the end, our movement. Well, first of all, who is Greg Owens and where is his hat? <laughs> um, this is a picture of my family. Uh, my lovely wife, Kate, is sitting over there at our booth. She's helping me pull this off this week. And those are my kids. And that is Easter Sunday after church um, with a couple of mimosas in our hand at the family farm uh, that's a five-generation farm in St. Peter, Minnesota. Um, it's about 1,000 acres. My father-in-law is retired from farming, so um, he leases out the land to his nephew who, who farms beans and, and corn. Um, back in the day, they had 150 head of cattle. There's still some pasture land around there. I think they 30, 40 head on there, they, they lease it out. Um, so that is where I will be one day settling in to retire. And by that time, I probably need to come up with a hat. So I've been looking around the room today, gathering ideas, and I think I've, I've got it down. So, okay, so as you heard during the introduction, Liberty Tabletop is a brand of flatware that um, we invented about five or six years ago. Um, it's our, the main company that I work for and that I co-founded along with Matt is Cheryl Manufacturing and we are in fact the only flatware manufacturer left in the United States. This uh, came about in 2005 when, how many people out there have heard of Oneida Limited? Oneida Flatware, a lot of, a lot of you probably have. Um, what ended up happening was uh, they were facing stiffer and stiffer competition from China. Um, thing that's pretty familiar. And it got to the point where they realized that they could buy product already produced in a box, FOB Long Beach, California, cheaper than they could buy the raw materials to make it with here in the United States. And you heard from some of uh, my co-members at CPA uh, about a lot of the reasons for that. Um, Zach, Brian brought those forth to the table. A lot of the reasons for that transpiring are the same reasons that cattle prices are so difficult to deal with today. So we're all sort of in the same boat, and that's what I'm here to talk about. Our business um, is not quite as old as Brian's, but uh, the offices that I sit in and the first manufacturing buildings were built when Abraham Lincoln was president. So this business has been around for an awful long time, and for it to have hit something as dramatic as it did in 2005 when Oneida shut it down and sold it to us, something pretty dramatic must have happened. Um, the products that we cho chose to sell, and then I'll get onto the presentation here, are basically high quality flatware. It's the type of stuff that you would think of bridal quality or heirloom quality, 1810 stainless, something that you'll have for a lifetime. Um, why Liberty Tabletop and why not Liberty Flatware? Um, our vision was to create an online store um, where you can go and find everything that you need for your tabletop. The flatware, the dishes, uh, the cutting boards, so forth and so on, the cookware, the dinnerware, um, all made in the United States. And that's what we're going about doing. Uh, the last uh, piece of the puzzle is the drinkware, which we should have on there sometime this fall. So, what is our shared cause? One of the things that we share is the affection that the American people have for things that are made in the United States of America. Uh, where's the beef from? The answer will surprise you. Um, this is a common thing with uh, consumer goods as well. If you think about Oneida Limited, many of us would go to the store, see an iconic brand that we would associate with something that's been made here forever, pick it off the shelf, 
And if we're lucky enough to turn it around, see that those things are now made in China. The multinational corporations, which we've heard a lot about over the course of the last two days, are playing hide the ball with that information. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But what I wanted to talk about first is when we created the Liberty Tabletop brand, we had to differentiate ourselves from everybody else. And the one thing that we had that no one else had was the ability to claim that we were the only flatware manufacturer left in the United States. So we latched on to Made in America as a brand. And we tried to break that up into different segments that could be used to get our message out to the public and make our argument in different ways. Now, the statistics will tell you that 10% of, of the American population, when they go to the store, insist upon buying American-made products. And 80% of the people, if given the information, will opt every time to buy the American-made product over the imported product. That is a pit, pretty powerful brand to latch on to, so that's what we wanted to do. So the first category of arguments or, or, or you know, things that we could tie ourselves to as an American brand were jobs, jobs, jobs. And in the manufacturing sector, that continues to be the strongest talking point, the strongest argument. Um, what you're going to see here, I should say, are not a bunch of shameless uh, ads trying to get you to buy my flatware. These are the actual uh, Facebook and Twitter marketing campaign ads that we used to get these particular messages across to the people that we were trying to reach in focused uh, target markets. So here you see a funny article. This one got a bunch of funny comments. Um, it's the giant magic pill designed to fix our economy. It's called bringing our jobs back. In the case of RCAF, it would be, you know, bring our heads back. Uh, let's, let's, get, let's get the cattle b production back up here in the United States. Here's another area that probably not a lot of us in this room, including myself, are real big on this whole global warming thing. A uh, lot of crazy information out there. But we realized that there is a direct correlation between, in manufacturing between environmental responsibility and the protection of our environment. I'm a business owner. I'm a CEO. A lot of people would think that I'm against environmental regulations protecting our rivers, forests, and streams. I happen to live in New York right now, but that's not the city. We live about 15, 20 minutes south of the Adirondacks, which is a beautiful area full of outdoor activities. The last thing that me or Matt or anybody in our company would want to do is ruin that environment. We realize that our company that gets our electricity through a municipal power contract from the city of Sherrill, guess where it comes from? It comes from hydropower from Niagara, New York. We also realized by doing research through the affiliation with CPA and just being interested in finding actual facts about the subject, that guess what China's footprint was back in, I don't know, 1970s? It wasn't even on the chart. The United States and the EU were the ones that were producing all the, the CO2 gases. Flash forward to 2018, China produces more CO2 gases than the EU and the United States combined. Like a lot of the issues that we talked about today, nobody knows about this. So these are powerful arguments that we can use to support Made in America where we have uh, environmental laws regulating how our steel is produced, that make sure that they're, 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 the steel mills are clean, that the electric that's used to produce that steel and produce our flatware is clean. We tout ourselves as the most eco-friendly flatware company on the planet and I think we can back that up probably by a factor of five. Another thing that multinationals don't like to talk about is one of the main reasons that they have shifted production overseas. Not only do they not have any environmental standards or environmental standards that are enforced in places like China, they also don't have any worker safety and, and worker um, rules that protect workers, allow them to unionize, so forth and so on. Um, many of you may have heard of the blood diamond argument. This particular ad happens to deal with coffee and some of the abysmal conditions that coffee is produced in, in, place, in certain places in Africa. And, you know, 
you, you buy your coffee from a, uh, a, a fair trade, which is what this particular uh, organization is called, country, assuring that it wasn't raised using slave labor or abysmal conditions, where did the spoon come from? And I can tell you firsthand some of the factories that are producing some of the goods that we buy every day that we don't think about are produced under some pretty abysmal conditions, not only to our environment, but to the workers who work in those factories, who in many cases live in dorm rooms stacked up six high, cooking off of one pan on an electric thing in the middle of the floor. There's a reason why Foxconn, the people who make your iPhones, had to put suicide nets on the factory windows to keep their people from jumping out and committing suicide because the conditions are that bad. Product safety. A little bit brighter note, taking a little bit more positive uh, take on it. Um, we uh, took the concept of farm to table, which a lot of you are probably pretty happy with. We call it factory to table. Uh, one of the ways that we reinvented our company was by eliminating all the middlemen. So when you go into a store like a Macy's and you buy a nice set of flatware, you don't realize this, but they're making about 70% on that. So that means that that $100 purchase, they paid 30. Whoever's brand name is on there, if it's Craftsman Tools or Oneida Flatware, made a 50% margin on that, so they bought it for 15 from some factory over in China. Well, we couldn't compete at that $15 level. So what we did was we created Liberty Tabletop. We sell direct to the customer at a competitive price, that $100. It costs us a lot more than 15 to make it, but we can, we can provide a competitive product made with all of these attributes, uh, paying living wages under good conditions, um, environmentally responsible, bring our jobs back in this factory to table business model. Oh, I should go back and talk about the other thing that this equates to is product safety. Uh, when we first started Liberty Tabletop, I took the customer service calls myself. And one of the biggest questions we got was, where does the steel come from? And I thought, well, maybe this is part of a made in America thing. No, what people were really concerned about is, here you have a product that's made out of steel and you're putting it in your mouth 50 to 60 times a day. They were concerned about what was in the metal. Now, I grew up in the, in the steel business and I've seen some first class steel mills all over the world. But I've also seen some not so first class steel mills where they're melting down just about anything to come up with that heat lot of steel. This is a legitimate concern. So product safety is another attribute for Made in America that I think uh, obviously is applicable to things that we eat as well as flatware. And then of course, American Made is associated with quality. And this is a big challenge to us in our particular factory. Um, when Matt ran it for the last couple years as Oneida, he was trying to compete. And by that, they were cutting costs cutting corners, polishing a little less, making things a little thinner as Oneida. When we bought the company, we made a conscious effort to reverse that trend because we knew that the brand made in America has to be a quality product and people are willing to pay for quality and we had to deliver that quality. So now we have this brand, um, we've got things rocking and rolling, but we have a couple issues. So. I did a couple things. I became engaged with our representatives in New York 22 at the, uh, and, and those representatives at the state level. And I also joined this organization called CPA. In fact, I think it was Brian O'Shaughnessy who first introduced me to CPA. And we sat down and had lunch and found that we had a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas about what the problems were in common. So this has led me on an adventure. Um, we've been in the White House. I uh, had an opportunity to speak directly with the president, albeit for about 30 seconds. Um, we've met with uh, Wilbur Ross. We've met with uh, Bob Lighthizer. We've met with a lot of different folks. And I guess the message that I'd like to get across today is two years ago when we first started going down there three years ago, uh, the mood was a little bit different. Um, the 
Made in America movement, the issues with China, the issues with trade, hadn't really taken a hold like they have today. And I, I'm not going to say that my faith in humanity has been completely restored by this experience. There are still some interesting folks down there with some very interesting ideas. But what I've found is that the trend is very sharply towards people coming to understand that the negative impacts of globalization and this globalist movement are real. That this notion that China was somehow going to come into the fold and become our friend and become a democracy and, and embrace uh, market economic practices simply was not true. They've done the opposite. Um, in the course of recognizing this, ideas like COOL, like the legislation that I'm going to show you here in just a second on country of origin labeling on our side, that we heard from another speaker today, people would just look at you and go, yeah, you know, you don't really understand that. It's, it's really more complicated than that. People are looking at us now saying, hey, you're in the right office. We, we agree with you. Um, we had uh, Marco Rubio show up at our um, fly-in dinner um, and speak to us. Here's a, a fellow who three, four years ago what, during the presidential uh, primaries was a pretty devout globalist. And he's seen the national security issues associated with China and some of the unfair trade practices, some of the uh, dollar issues that we have with the overvalued dollar. And um, he's flipped around 180 degrees and would be um, very supportive of, of the ideas that we're talking about today. So. Uh, it's not all bad news coming out of Washington, but think of it as a giant aircraft carrier. It's going to take a little bit to turn this thing around, but my sense is that it's happening and it's swinging in our direction. So as co-chair of the Buy America Committee for CPA, one of the things that we're working on um, is Jim Stuber's uh, dream of a bill called FACOTA, uh, the Fair Country of Origin Disclosure Act. Um, much like COOL, what this would do is it would require country of origin to be listed on products that are sold on the internet. Today, when you go into the store, you are supposed to be able to flip that box around and find the country of origin of pretty much everything that you buy, except for beef, truthfully and, 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 and predominantly displayed on that box. Um, that is simply not the case. Um, on the internet. And in fact, it's a law that has been largely ignored and here's an example that Jim came up with of uh, Spalding basketballs. Here you go. Iconic brand. Who knew? Made in China. They actually have made in China on the basketball hidden within the packaging. You have to open it up to find out where that product is made. So about three or four years ago, you used to be able to go on sites, the large multinationals like Amazon, and they would list uh, what the country of origin was for the products. They were trying to comply with this law just as if you'd go into the store and it had to be on the packaging. Well, if you know anything about Amazon, which I do because I set up our account on there, when you list a product, it's up to the person listing the product to fill out the information, and it's up to them to make it true and accurate. And what someone found, probably someone like myself in competition with a company, was that people were lying about it. They were claiming that things were made in America when they were not. They were made in China or other places. So they went after Amazon with the best intentions of forcing Amazon to police and correct these indiscretions. What ended up happening was Amazon said, well, the way that the uh, country of origin labeling laws are written, probably doesn't even include the internet. So they removed it altogether. So you go on Amazon, you go on most websites, and unless it's a product made in the United States from a manufacturer who's proud to put that on there, or someone selling it who knows how powerful that brand is, it's unlikely that they're going to tell you where it's from. They're playing hide the ball. So we have a bill um, that is in its final stages of being crafted, it will be a bipartisan bill called the FACOTA bill. Um, and it will require Amazon and others to prominently display
country of origin on all listings on the internet. Similar to meat in your store, that truthful information we feel is not only something the public wants, but it's something they have the right to know. So there it is, FACOTA. All right, hands up everybody in this room who has ever heard of the de minimis rule. Two. That's because they heard me talk about it on the fly in. Um, it's fairly easy to explain. Um, most of you have at one point in your lives traveled outside of the country and have come back on the airplane or in the car and you were handed a little simple piece of paper where you had to list all the stuff that you purchased while you were overseas. And as long as it didn't exceed a certain limit, they would grab it, they would stamp it, they would hand it to you, and you'd be on your way. Has almost everybody had that experience? Um, that limit used to be a couple hundred dollars until a couple hundred year, or a couple years ago when um, Congress raised the limit to $800. Now, de minimis means a small or meaningless amount. How many people in here think $800 is a small or de minimis amount of money? I, I don't know. Maybe there's some multimillionaires in the room, I'm sure there is, that think that's just chump change, but I, uh, I happen to think $800 is, is, is not a small amount of money. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. The de minimis rule has been extended to cover express shipments. And what I'm going to tell you about is, it almost sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's very true and very well researched. So what it comes to now is using that same rule that allows an individual to bring back something from their vacation, or a business person to bring samples, or, or, or something like that. These rules were written before the internet even existed, they're now being used by companies like Amazon and others to bring in e-commerce items. They're being used by Chinese companies to ship products directly into the United States one at a time without paying any duty, without paying any taxes, without doing any sort of formal traceable um, declaration that customs can keep track of we're calling it e-commerce without borders. It gets worse than that. To send an individual package from China, one by one, to customers throughout the United States would be tremendously expensive. It would, it's much cheaper to put it all in a container and bring it over at once and distribute it like that. So what Amazon and other 3PL or warehousing service, service companies have done is they have set up warehouses along the Mexican border. So they'll bring in container loads of products, toasters, for example. Bring in three container loads of toasters, park them on the Mexican border in a warehouse. You go into Amazon, you order your filled by Amazon thing, you order a toaster. They have a Mexican warehouse worker pull that off the shelf, box it up, print out a US post office or a UPS label, slap it on the box, and they shove it all in a truck. And they list it on a manifest as one customer for each package on that truck. They roll up to customs in Laredo or McGowan or wherever. They hand customs the manifest. It just simply lists what all these boxes are. Customs stamps it just like they do to your thing when you come in from, from, from Europe. That truck rolls across the border backs up to the post office, dumps all those products onto the, onto the dock, no duty, no traceability. It has been widely reported um, and is being investigated that this is a major way that fentanyl is coming into the United States. Um, as if brick and mortar retail didn't have enough problems, this is giving Amazon and other retailers a distinct advantage by being able to usurp the tariffs. It's costing our government billions of dollars in lost tariff revenue, and customs is simply inundated. 
Imagine having a list of relatively few producers in China, thousands of them, selling to a relatively small list of retailers or importers in the United States and then taking that list of importers and expanding it by individual sales. It's impossible for them to know who's selling it and who they're selling it to. There's no formal records of it. So they really have no idea how much revenue they're losing because they don't even really know what the products are worth. So this is a huge problem. So there's this organization called the 321 Coalition that formed that's trying to make it even worse. What they're trying to do is to be able to have companies like Amazon take their warehouses, turn them into free trade zones, and use the free trade zones to be able to import these things so they can circumvent the whole Mexican process, bring them into their free trade zones, do all their filled by Amazon stuff out of the free trade zones, and circumvent duties and all that other kind of stuff. And the, the argument, as funny as it may sound, is that we're losing thousands of jobs to Mexico because we're not doing this here in the United States. We'd rather do this here in the United States. It's absolutely crazy. Um, you go down to Washington, and I walked around Capitol Hill for a whole week. I asked our representatives and the staffers if they had ever heard of this. None of them had. But much like the cool issue and much like some of the other issues like currency that we talked about, it's critical for us to understand these things, like Brian said this morning, and then get that information out to the public. Because every representative that I talked to down in Washington was outraged by this. And if all we have to do is get the information to them, in the case of the Fair Country of Origin Labeling Act, I actually got so emotional about one day, my tagline was going to be, I dare you to vote against this. How could you possibly stand up in front of your constituents and tell them that you voted against their right to know where their beef, where their flatware, or where anything else was coming from? It's an outrage. And I think we need to put that kind of pressure on them to get them to capitulate with, with these laws. Um, the third thing that I wanted to talk about today is the power that is in our hands. And this was something we just came out with the other day, and the graphic really got everybody's attention, and it's sort of gone a little bit viral with the help of some ad dollars um, on Facebook. And that is the notion that we can vote with our pocketbooks. We don't need to wait for Washington to pass a bunch of laws. It would be nice if we could provide people with information on where their products are coming from, and we're going to work hard to do that. But once we provide that information, it's important for everyone to understand that when you buy a hat, when you buy a pair of boots, when you buy an automobile, when you buy a set of flatware, when you buy beef, you want to support American manufacturing with your purchases. And if Americans just bound together and we spent a little bit more effort making sure that we do that, flip that box over, and in a lot of cases in retail stores, you're not going to find products that are made in the USA. So if it's something of significance, go on to Google. I, most of you probably have uh, the internet at home, and just type in whatever you're looking for made in the USA. And if there's somebody out there manufacturing it, growing it, or raising it, chances are they're going to pop up, and you're going to be able to buy that directly from them probably save a little bit of money and support domestic manufacturing, agriculture, and ranching. There is something going on in Indianapolis this October that's going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, Don Buckner um, sold his company, took some of the proceeds from that, and he's trying to make his dream come true, and that is a trade show that is full of products that are all made in the United States. And his bar for made in the United States is pretty high. He's turned down a couple companies that were assembled in the United States or made in the United States with parts from, from other parts. Um, this is going to be a fantastic show. I think uh, as, as it builds, we're going to have uh, Tommy Lauren is going to be out there uh, representing and broadcasting from the show. 
Um, we hope to have members of the administration, uh, other politicians from both sides of the aisle that are on our side on these issues, and hundreds of manufacturing companies, farmers, ranchers, people selling products that are made in the United States represented in the booths at the show. It's this October. I hope to see all of you there.